Now, I've been doing this foolishness for about 30 years, and so it turned into a brain dump. And uh, this presentation has hot links throughout it. The presentation's available on my website. Uh, we'll get you a link to it. Actually, there's a QR code for it out of the table if you're impatient. Uh, if there's any doubt at all, Googling Al Clace will get you to my website and you can dig your way in. Uh, fortunately, it's a unique enough name that nobody else has it. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> crystal radios, this has been a DIY thing for about 100 years now, and they're really kind of fascinating devices because what you're talking about here are passive radio receivers. There's no amplification, there's no batteries, there's no power supply. All the energy that gets to your eardrum came from the transmitter. And when that's a thousand miles away, it's kind of a thrill. Uh, basically, if you get serious about this, you're going to need some kind of antenna, some kind of wire up in the air. Unless, of course, you're a city mouse, like up in Jersey City, where 10 or 15 feet inside the house will do it. Uh, you're going to need some sort of audio transducer. We'll talk about this. And the heart of the matter here is a tuned circuit. And the, the, the big tricks are to get this properly matched to the detector and headset and out to the antenna to get you know, optimal energy transfer. And we'll, we'll talk about all of this. Uh, editorial comment here. Over that 100 years, millions and millions of crystal sets have been built. You know, things that look like this. And they, the vast majority of them were just horrible perf performers. You know, you'd hear one local station and that was it. And, uh, but it's not too difficult to build a crystal set that really works. So we're going to approach that tonight. Little history here. You go back to Marconi in 1896. He didn't even tune his radio. He had a, a plain spark gap between the antenna and ground. On the receiver end, you had this crude thing called a, a coherer that when a radio wave came in here, this gets sticky and current would flow through it. Uh, but but the, it's actually an amplifier because it'll leave current flow through it enough that you could run a Morse a Morse anchor and also run a tapper to hammer on it and make it conduct again. Well, that died out pretty quick, but that's how Marconi got started. One of the things I do find fascinating about Marconi is if you think back to Heinrich Hertz, his early radio experiments, he's got a spark gap and he's got two halves of his antenna like this and he's working on VHF. Marconi was trained as a, a telegrapher, so when he gets going on this and comes down out of his attic, starts working in the backyard, he buries half of his antenna. And that forever, the antenna working against ground becomes known as the Marconi antenna. That's generally what we're dealing with with crystal sets uh, because a dipole would be you know, 400 feet long or something like that. So that's the beginnings with Marconi. But he pretty quickly sees the light, the need for tuning, and he gets professional help from people like Sir Oliver Lodge. Uh, this is Marconi's famous four sevens patent from 1900. And so what Lodge did, he took a Leyden jar, capacitor, and a coil here, and operated the spark gap in this tuned circuit. That inductively couples to another tuned circuit. The antenna looks like a capacitor, so there's the closed circuit here and the open circuit over here. In the receiver, you do exactly the opposite thing. You tune the antenna capacitance and you couple it into a closed circuit. Now here, as early as 1900, in this drawing, they've got a responder feeding a telephone. And uh, recently got looking around when Marconi did the 1901 transatlantic experiments, you know, the letter S and all this stuff. He used this kind of setup, and he used a telephone receiver that looked like this. This is from a company called Collier in, in England. And uh, it was interesting. It looks like he added 
extra windings on the magnet here, probably ran DC through it to make the magnet stronger and the, head, and the telephone more sensitive. So they were hacking even back then. Uh, like I said, this presentation has hot links throughout it, so if you get interested in this stuff, you can, you can delve down into it. Um, now, the antenna ground system. Uh, configuration called inverted L, that's up and over. 20 feet up, 40 foot over, that's a good start. You know, out in the country, you can, that's, that's enough antenna to do the job. If you're a ham and have a dipole up in the air, 40 meter, 80 meter dipole, something like that. On the feed line, those antennas roll off really drastically bef below the half wave frequency. So they won't do squat for a crystal set. So what you do is you short your coax together at the receiver end and work that against ground, work it as a T antenna against ground, and that'll, that'll work pretty good. Uh, then, of course, there's all kinds of improvised antenna wires wherever you can put it, clip onto the rain gutters. In the old days in the cities, you remember the, bed, the open bed springs? You clip your crystal set to the bed springs, you use that for an antenna. Now, electrically, an antenna like this. Your antenna is almost always going to be less than a quarter wave in length. That means it's going to look capacitive to the radio. Uh, we'll talk about this part of it a little, little later, but it's basically a, a, the, there's this thing called the Radio Manufacturers Association official dummy load, and their value for the average antenna is 200 picofarads, so that's the one you'll see me use. You also want a ground. Grounds are where you find it, like so. Uh, but just two weeks ago, I had a situation at the museum where I needed to move a crystal set around. So I invented the portable ground. Take one of those computer cords, strip it back. You know the color code. Green is ground, the European ones, green and yellow is ground chop these off so they don't short, put some shrink tubing on that. You can plug it in anywhere. In most modern buildings, the electrical safety ground is probably the best ground you're going to get because it hooks to a whole web of wires. So uh, before you go crazy on multiple eight-foot ground rods and stuff like that, try, try the electrical ground. Uh, let me talk engineering just for a little bit. This is an engineering presentation. Let's talk about decibels. Uh, the decibel system is relative power measurement on a logarithmic scale. And the reason we do this is you got situations like, yeah, I can hear this little tiny signal in my best headset, but a two volt signal hurts my ears. And so you have this huge range of possible voltages and powers. And so reckoning this as a logarithmic thing uh, is, is really helpful. By the way, the uh, de decibel, dec the bell here comes from Alexander Graham Bell, who did some of the early research in, in hearing and this sort of stuff. And he got named for, of course, deci is a tenth of a bell. Uh, so when you talk about dB, it's power ratio. And you can calculate it as 10 times the log of the ratio of the powers. If you're just working with voltages in a constant, uh, a constant impedance, it's 20 times the voltage ratio. Then we see things like dBm. That's power relative to 1 milliwatt. In any case here, a 1 dB change, that's almost the tiniest change in audio you'd ever be able to detect. Uh, 3 dB change is a modest change, you'll hear that, and that's twice the power. 6 dB is twice the voltage, and then on down, 10 dB is 10, 20 dB is 100, 30 dB is 1,000 times the power. So I'll be referencing things in dB here after a while, so I kind of wanted to go through that. Okay, headphones, audio transducers. You know, transducer, is a device that changes energy from one form to another. And even your antenna ground system is a transducer in that it intercepts electromagnetic waves and makes it into electrical current coming into your radio. 
and coming out the other side, you need an audio transducer to make the electrical currents into sound. So the beginnings of all of this is the good old Bell dual pole telephone. And you've all seen those hanging on the, tel the old telephone sets, the ones in the museum and whatnot. But pretty soon they figured out that telephone operators didn't have enough hands to hold one of those up and still manage the switchboards. So they invented the head telephone, the so-called watch case receiver. This is the two, the two pole thing folded up like so. This is a Western Electric 509 headset. Now, the early headsets, the telephone ones, they're sort of built to work into 600, 600 ohmish uh, impedances. And that's no good working into a crystal set or into the, into the plate of a vacuum tube. So the common radio headset becomes the so-called 2000 ohm headset. That's 2000 ohms DC. And that translates into about 10k ohms impedance at, at one kilohertz. Uh, and the difference there is those things, each one of those has about 1,000 feet of number 40 wire wound up in each, in each earphone. So that's your classic 2,000 ohm headset. Some other things that can be used, like I said, 2,000 ohm headsets. Um, the so-called crystal earpiece, these are the ones that came with all the rocket radios and the crystal kits we had when we were kids. Uh, the modern ones aren't even, they used to be Rochelle salt crystal, but the modern ones are, are piezoelectric ceramics of some sort. <clears throat> They're pretty good if you can, if you can find them and the, the, the sensitivity is about the same as a 2000 ohm headset. Now, there are other, other forms of transducers. Most of them are of a lower impedance, but have a lot higher uh, sensitivity. Uh, and one class of these is so-called sound-powered headsets. Uh, this thing over here is what the Navy called a deck talker. You see the, the guys in the World War II ships on the gun mounts with the helmet that has the extensions over his ears. That's because there's one of these big cans, headsets under it. And it's a sound-powered telephone, so you can talk to the guy at the other end. As long as you got two wires, you don't need batteries, the whole rest of the ship can be shot away and you can still talk. But these things are real sensitive. Uh, and they do that by a so-called, instead of that two-pole metal diaphragm arrangement, uh, they have what's called a balanced armature mechanism. There's a flat piece of metal here. It's got a pivot in the middle, two sets of coils, and so it pushes and pulls. And then there's a push rod that goes to the, the diaphragm. Uh, one of the examples of that is the Nathaniel Baldwin headsets from 1910. There's a lot of these around. Uh, they're pretty sensitive. Uh, they're, a little, they're a little peaky. They were good for CW, but, but you'll run into Baldwin headsets. Anyway. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same, it, this is a mag, there's a magnet structure here and here. In fact, I guess this whole thing around here is magnet, and then there's coils. Yeah, you, with, without a magnet, you'd have a bias problem. It wouldn't really work right. So uh, here's some headphone data. This was stuff I did about 20 years ago when my ears still worked, okay? But I went in and did some careful testing you know, adjusting the impedances and things, and then turning the audio input down until I got to just minimum of discernible signal. So st I started with some of the World War, one of the World War II Navy headsets, and these are only about pretty low resistance, and the impedance is, is just, you know, a couple hundred ohms, and they turn out not to be real sensitive. You could hear down to about minus 63 dB. Now, um, the, t the 2000 ohm headsets, I had different two, two trim sets. They were good down to about 70. Uh, the um, crystal ear plug was good down to about 70. Uh, I had a brush, brush company made a crystal headset. Most of them have succumbed to the 
some succumbed to age, but I had one that was pretty well working. Uh, they have, like the, like the ear plug, they have infinite impedance. They're a ceramic, they're a, a, a piezoelectric device, a little bit higher impedance. And that was good down to about 74. Uh, the Baldwin's were good down to about 76. So 70, 75, 76 is what you can expect from those standard headsets. Now, when you went to the sound-powered headsets, all of a sudden this minus 70 number is now down minus 84, minus 88. I mean, minus 88 dBm is only a couple of picowatts. It's an amazingly small amount of energy, and you can still hear things on a sensitive headset down there. Now, you can go you can go digging around on the uh, on eBay and at the ham fest and things for sound powered headsets. People have kind of figured out that they're good for crystal sets. They want kind of a lot of money for them. These are the basic deck talkers. These are the more modern navy ones. These have nice cushy ear 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 pieces. But I recently discovered that a lot of the dollar store earplugs are nearly as sensitive as these guys. That's, and I, I attribute this to the rare earth magnets. You got a strong magnetic field, so it makes it easier to build an efficient transducer. And uh, these, these little guys with the orange here, I bought a bunch of those for a particular purpose, and they were a dollar a piece. You know, I think that was one of these 10X eBay things. And they're about as good as the, as, as the sound-powered headsets. Now, in both these cases, the sound-powered headsets and the earbuds, you need a transformer so you can get from about 10K down to 60 ohms, 100 ohms, 300 ohms, whatever it is. So uh, that's part of the deal there. Let's talk about testing headsets. And you kind of want to do, you pick up a headset, I've got to build a crystal set. If it's a 2,000 ohm headset, hold on to one pin, touch the other pin to a ground while you have the headset on in a quiet room. You should hear a click. If you don't hear a click, either it's the wrong impedance headset or get your ohm meter out because a lot of times these things have bad cords. But uh, a, good, a good headset will pass this test, as will a low impedance headset matched with an appropriate transformer. So that's a quick and dirty way before you get all excited about this, that, and the other thing to make sure you have a headset that's gonna, that has a chance of working. Now, what about crystals? Well, I mentioned Marconi back in 1901, and he was using a device called the Italian Navy Coherer. And this is a glass tube that had a carbon rod and an iron rod with a lump of mercury between it. And I, somehow you hooked up a battery and this would... The, see, the answer is you need something that's non-linear and then it will rectify a little bit and you can get some audio out of your RF. Uh, it turns out the Italian Navy didn't invent this. Uh, Chandra Bose Indian scientist who did a lot of work at early radio is the guy really responsible for this. And what they were looking for, what they were calling it, was a self-restoring coherer. You remember that coherer? You had to come back and bang on it. How about a coherer that doesn't do that? It will just hook a telephone to it. So they were looking for things of that sort. Later they call these imperfect contact detectors because of course they went in and figured out that they weren't really ohmic. Yes. And uh, so that's the beginning of this. Kind of next step, about 1906 or so, Reginald Fessenden, uh, I guess one of my favorite radio scientists, he did a lot of stuff. He designed a, an electrolytic rectifier to use it as a detector. Uh, this involves a, 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 a microscopically fine piece of wire here that gets dipped in, in nitric acid or something like that. And, Sure enough, you can use it for a detector and a radio. By the way, that's the device that, uh, that, that Lee DeForest got sued for 
because he tried to steal it. But uh, that, that only persisted for a couple of years because this guy shows up, uh, Greenleaf Whittier Picard. By, by the way, he's John Ru Greenleaf Whittier's grandnephew. That's how he came up with the name. Uh, <clears throat> but he patents a silicon detector in 1906, and then he sorts through thousands of minerals. Patents the carborundum detector in 1909. He shows the cat's whisker in 1911. They, in here, he establishes a company called Wireless Specialty Apparatus Company. And in, in the museums, you'll see detectors of this sort. Some of these have different minerals on them, and you can spin them around and choose the mineral you want to use. But that's Picard, and he's the guy primarily responsible for crystal detectors. So. When it comes time to, to pick a detector diode, what you want is a point contact germanium diode, and, uh, or maybe the junction on, on a germanium transistor. But you got this diode laying there, how do I know what it is? Hook it to your horrible freight multimeter in the diode test position, and the number on the display is the forward voltage drop of the diode. And, uh, Germanium's going to be down in the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 range, and silicon's going to be up in the 0.5 or so range. So that's just how you test them. Uh, if, you, if, if you have glass diodes, you can get a look inside them. You can see this little cat's whisker kind of thing. That lets you know for sure it's a point contact diode. Part numbers don't mean a whole lot. Everybody has 1N34 in their head because that's what we all saw in the magazines when we were kids and whatnot. Uh, it's my belief the 1N34 was actually a fallout part from the computer parts they were building under other part numbers, and then the ones that didn't make the tests, they sold as 1N34s. Uh, they're not real consistent. If you have a bunch of diodes, just dump a ball out and try them in your radio and pick the one that works best. Now, we're here in the 21st century, there is another angle on detectors in, uh, in passive receivers. And that is that you take an FET transistor operating as a your tune circuit, which is a fairly high impedance. You have a, a coil link to it that's maybe a tenth of the number of turns. And so you have low impedance here you run that through the switch out to the headset, and now the switch is actu actuated by the high voltage coming off the top of the tune circuit. So it turns the switch on on every RF half cycle and rectifies the signal, comes out to the headset. There's indications that you can get more sensitivity out of this than you will out of any diode detector. Uh, I'm not sure we can call it a crystal set if it's using a uh, if, if it's using a MOSFET transistor. But uh, uh, that's the brave new world here. There's some little tiny four-pin surface mount guys that were in TV tuners that you can, that you can buy. This guy named Billy from, uh, from Hong Kong has a quite comprehensive website on this. You get interested in this. I haven't tried this yet. I've, it's on my list, but I haven't gotten to it. But... Uh, uh, that's where, where things are, go, are going these days. Okay, let's build a radio. You got your antenna ground system, headphones, you got a diode, wire them up just like that. Uh, I was out of my mind one day and I did it this way using uh, paper clips for electrical contacts and things, but clip leads will do just fine. You hook this thing up, Assuming you have a strong station and a decent antenna, you'll hear it. If you have two strong stations, you'll hear them both at the same time. But now you know that you have a headset, you have a detector, and you have an antenna ground system. So then from there, push forward and let's, let's build a real radio. So, same components. Let's add a, tune, a, a, a coil here that resonates the antenna capacitance 
and allows us to tune the thing. And like I said, millions of these were made. You know, the old oatmeal box radio. Uh, I, this picture was interesting. We always see the pictures of the Quaker Oats radio, but I can remember the, uh, we always had mother's oats at home and on the label or something, on the late, somewhere you say Quaker's oats, mother's oats, the same fine oatmeal. But I grew up on, on mother's oats. But anyhow, uh, yeah, if you want to build something like this for old time's sake, go ahead. But you're kind of wasting your time. They don't work all that well. Uh, and what I think one of the problems is the sliding contact, if it contacts two coil, two, two adjacent turns at the same time, it's a short turn in your inductor. And, that's counterproductive. So what was missing in that schematic? Variable capacitors. Now, variable capacitors have always been expensive. That's why they didn't use them in those millions of cheap crystal sets. Uh, and it hasn't changed a whole lot. You can still go on, on eBay or Amazon and somebody will sell you one of these old classic 365 puff variables for 25 bucks. Hey, but you guys are radio collectors. You know, you, you have stuff like this laying around. If you're fortunate, you have Hammerlin stuff with porcelain insulators and all that kind of stuff, which will give you better cue in the, in the end. And if you don't have anything, grab the next All-American 5 radio wreck you encounter and use the parts from there. So, what circuit should I use? Here's, th this, is, this is where I, get, this is where I get, get frustrated with the whole thing. Eight out of 10 books you ever read about crystal sets showed you that schematic, right? Well, it's a brain dead dumb circuit. And uh, I have a, a a thing on my web page that runs through the various circuit topologies for, for crystal sets. I won't bother with that now, but let's look, let's look at this. Another, another engineering lecture here, impedance matching. We all throw that term around, but what does that really mean? Uh, any signal source, you treat it as a perfect voltage source, like in this case, 10 volts. And what that means is it doesn't matter. You can hook jumper cables in your car to that, it's going to give you 10 volts no matter what happens. But in the real world, there's a series impedance or resistance associated with that, which limits the current that that signal source can deliver. And so we're going to see how much energy we can get out of here. And so we'll hook a load to it. If it's a 10 ohm internal impedance and we put a 10 ohm resistor on it, that's as good as we can do. We get two and a half watts out, 100% of the available power. Now, I tell people about impedance matching. It's like horseshoes and hand grenades coming close counts. Because if you're off by 10%, you're still getting 99.6% of the power out of the thing. And even if you're off by a factor of 10, you're still getting 40% of the power. Uh, to look at that in decibels, Perfect match, one to one, zero dB loss. You get the whole deal. Two to one, you're only missing half a dB, which you couldn't hear that anyway. Four to one, it's you know one point, almost two dB. Ten to one, well, then it's getting to be 4.8. So in what we're going to do, let's try to avoid as many of these 100 to one and 1,000 to one and maybe 10 to one mismatches as we can to get efficient energy transfer through the radio out to our headset. So this, is, this drawing's a little busy, but let's, let's look at it this way. In the middle here, we have our coil and our variable capacitor. They're set up so they tune the frequency we want. Uh, this circuit's going to have an impedance of, oh, something like 150,000 ohms. And out here you are with your 10,000 ohm headset. And when you've got a strong signal, the diode gets pretty much turned on. And you know, you're know looking at sort of 10,000 ohms out here. If I connect that to the top of the tuned circuit and ground, like in that circuit in the books, we're 
badly mismatched into the tank circuit here. And not only do we get less output, but it destroys the Q of the circuit and you lose your, sen you lose your selectivity. So the fix is, and you know, roughly with your 2000 ohm headset, 10,000 ohms AC, tap your diode halfway down the coil. That'll get you to a pretty good place and so you'll be presenting an efficient load to the tune circuit. Now, on the other side here, we have our antenna ground system feeding signal in here. If we hook that, is this thing going dead on me? If we hook this piece here to the top of the coil up here, we've got a 365 puff cap here, and we go toning toward the top frequencies. This gets down to about zero, but we still have 200 puff out here, so you don't get the tuning range. So you've got to make some adjustments. And the AM broadcast band is kind of a tough deal because you're tuning a three to one frequency range, and then you want to be able to accommodate antennas of varying lengths and varying capacitances. So the answer here, and this is, there's a couple ways to do this, but the answer I chose is taps on the inductor. And if you have a short antenna or high, for, or low, you have short antenna, you go up to the top, long antenna farther down, and uh, you, you tune in the station and then you move the tap one way or the other and see if it gets better. This lets you achieve a, a better match. Uh, there's another way to do this. You could forget about these taps on this side, put another variable capacitor here in series with the antenna, and now you can juggle the two capacitances and, and tune it pretty well. Some people like that circuit. I just hit on this years ago and kind of stuck with it. So this is the kind of circuit I recommend using. Uh, for me, this started back around 1990. I was running a Cub Scout den and I remembered that there were crystal set projects when I was a Cub Scout. I never did one, but I remember it was in the books. So I said, well, let's have these kids build crystal sets. And we were deep in the Philadelphia suburbs, out halfway out to Reading. There were no strong local stations. There was one, but it wasn't, you know, it was two kilowatts or something like that. So I knew if we made one of those brain dead crystal sets, and sent it home that it would never do anything. So I did a little work and came up with this, the, the DEN2 crystal set, uh, spider web coil on a cut out plastic form uh, that we just brought up taps and, and soldered them and the taps are selected by, a, by an alligator clip diode over here and we used, used the, uh, the piezoelectric headsets when I bought the capacitors. Uh, the nice thing about the spider web coils is that 10 or 11 year old hands can manage that. Asking them to wind a solenoid and keep it tight and all. Those kids only have two fingers that work. And, you know, so this was a better deal. The only thing is you've got to be careful. You've got to watch them because if they get the coil wound halfway and get confused and wind the other half of the coil the other direction, now they have no inductance. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was a good solution there. A few years later, uh, I'll tell you a little bit, about, bit more about the set. There's, there's a schematic. Now, uh, I, I, a few years later, I had this published in, the, 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 in Crystal Set Projects from the uh, Crystal Set Society. But anyhow, with a reasonable antenna, a radio like this will hear 50 kilowatt stations out to 40 or 50 miles away. And at night, the distance stations will be just about as strong as these guys, and you'll hear stations out maybe 300 miles easily. CH 900 CH element in, in Hamilton, Ontario is pretty strong down here. So you can, you can hear the locals, you can hear the, the local big guns, and you can get DX. And so, you know, it's sort, sort of, I think, the minimal sort of crystal set you want to build. Uh, moving forward to 2006, 
Some of you remember we ran the crystal set seminars down at InfoAge. Uh, same circuit, different coil. Uh, solenoid wound on a four and a half inch form here. That gets you better Q. And uh, I, I recommend, the, recommend this construction. Uh, tempered masonite, you can buy it in two by four sheets at, at the home center. That's a pretty good uh, substitute for Bakelite and some sort of three quarter inch wood if you're, if you're flush will buy, uh, buy birch plywood, if not some piece of shelving board you have laying around. But this gives you a, a solid place to mount your components and make a tidy radio without, without going crazy on metal work or any of that stuff. Uh, here's people winding their coils at the, who, who's this guy up here? Oh, he's not here tonight. But anyhow, what you want to do is take your piece, you know, calculate the length of your wire, in our case I think it was 80 feet, tie it off to something, we had a cyclone fence down there, and then wind pulling tension on it the whole way and, and you'll get a nice tight coil without a lot of fuss. Uh, what, what, what that design does, you have a piece of cardboard that you slip under the appropriate turns and that gives you a place to make your taps later on. So I'm a believer in the, the pretty good crystal set and uh, uh, you know if you need a design you want to follow closely, there's instructions for that on the website. Uh, did some, talk, some talking on the website about air core coils. Like, as I mentioned there, I used four and a half inch forms, which were uh, pipe couplings from the home store. At that time, they were a dollar a piece. Um, but there's a case for making your coils big. The Q increases as the square of the diameter because you're ending up with less wire length and consequently less loss. Um, I used to say make them square, that is diameter equals the length. That isn't really accurate. What you want to, what you, the, the sweet spot is that the winding length is about 2.5 times the diameter. That isn't real critical, but you know, don't, don't take a thing this, this round and wind it that long. It, it just doesn't make a good coil. Yes? Right. Well, you, have, you have less resistance because you use less wire to well, achieve the inductance. The right well, the, 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 the thing there is that, that the inductance also increases as the square of the diameter. Right, okay. So, so, so you, you're getting away with less wire. Okay. Now, another thing, and, and you see a lot of radio coils wound with enameled magnet wire close wound. Yeah, that'll work, but it's, it's, it's a bad deal because these windings are very close. Each winding is in the magnetic field of the adjacent winding and that induces losses. So what you'd like to have is maybe a wire diameter between each winding. And yeah, if you use Normal insulated wire, that'll kind of happen all by itself. Uh, I've used all kinds of stuff. If you can't find anything, uh, Home Depot sells number 20 bell wire. Uh, the only downside is there it's twisted pair. You have to untwist it to get a single piece of wire, but you can use half of it for your antenna and half for the radio. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you don't want you don't want you don't want close wound with very thin insulation. But also, also that uh, increases the inter inter interturn capacitance. And, and you increase the interturn capacitance, which can cause you trouble too. May I mention another thing? Yes. PVC is extremely low loss at R, extremely lossy at RF. My, our experience has been the PVC, PVC is kind of okay uh, if you can find ABS or, or no. some other plastic, you know, then uh, do cardboard it. Cardboard is better. Uh, bamboo is superb if you can get mm. a good big diameter <laughs> and it grows it's for free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you you got to talk to Paul Hart about bamboo sometime, but that's a long story. <laughs> Let's see. 
if a lot of modern hookup wire is Teflon insulated and silver plated, if you can find some of that, that's that's nice stuff for for coils. Uh, here's a pretty good crystal set that our own Joe Jev Devonshire built last winter and ended in entered in the DX contest. He's when I say halfway down east, he's halfway up the state of Maine, and he logged number of stations from New York City and even 1210 WPHT down in South, Philly, South Jersey, which is another 100 miles farther down. So that's the kind of performance you can get without a lot of fuss. You have an antenna, you have a half decent headset. There it is. Do you know what he used for antenna? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it was anything extreme. Okay. Uh, if you're handy, like this is, this is a, a pretty good crystal set. I, I had a box, built one in the box, used some vintage tap switches, designed a, a detector for it. Uh, this went out as a Christmas present. Somebody got it. I don't remember who, but uh, now another alternative for the co for the coils, and this has some real advantages, is ferrite cores which are ceramics that have uh, magnetic properties. And you can get the inductance you need in a small space. These things you see here are 8 tenths of an inch in diameter. Um, <clears throat> and the magnetic field is contained within the core. When you have a big core, coil, if, if you're really looking for high performance, you get that near large metal things, and now you have losses, now you get detuned, and all kinds of stuff like that. The ferrite cores beat that. They don't need a whole lot of wire. You can make a, a little bobbin like that and just wind them up, twist the taps in them. In this case, I just soldered the taps to the tap switch, and away you go. Now, the one caution about ferrite cores you got to know what ferrite you're dealing with. There's different recipes for ferrites, and they're designed for different frequencies and different purposes. Some of them were actually designed to eat RF, like in filter chokes and stuff like that. So what you want is what's called Mix 61, uh, and these FT8261s, uh, you can currently buy three of those for 10 bucks on, uh, on Amazon. So that's a, a good, and the other part of this is if you just have magnet wire laying around, if it's old stuff, they used to use an insulation called form var, which is high temperature, like for motors and generators and stuff like that. And it's a pain in the ass to try to solder. You gotta scrape it or use paint remover on it or something like that. Low temperature magnet wire, most of what you find these days, you can just solder right through it. And so that's what you, what you want to have. And again, that's widely available. You can buy a quarter pound of it for eight or 10 bucks or something like that. And that's all you're ever going to use. Uh, so this lets you build small radios. Uh, this was a set I built. I, I came into a bunch of these little boxes. They, they held military accelerometers that, you know, some of the stuff we're still paying for and uh, but they're nice little boxes and so I built built a couple of crystal sets like this same circuit uh, when you're going to use a ceramic earpiece here you want to put a resistor eh, 68k or so across here because the ceramic thing just looks like a capacitor and you don't have a proper DC load on your detector so you use the You'll hear, you'll hear audio distortion. You put the resistor in and it goes away. Uh, article on my uh, website, the adventures I had with this, including listening to it in a moving car coming down the turnpike through the Meadowlands. Uh, so a lot of fun, nice little radios. Uh, gave a couple of these away. Gave a set like that to my uh, daughter-in-law. She was 
She was underwhelmed, and then two years later, they ended up out of power for five days, and they brought the radio out and played it. <laughs> Got an understanding for it. Uh, I don't know who this guy is, but he ended up with one of these at the Christmas party a while back. Yeah, he's an old man now. D did you marry your daughters off yet? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, this, this, was, this, was the, this was the antenna hanging out of the... Uh, hanging out of the, the sunroof of my wife's car when we did the Crystal Set Mobile thing. No, I, I, I took that radio. It's in my bedroom dresser. And I pulled it out about three, four months ago. And I took it out and I put it in the bedroom. But then again, no radios have a signal in my house anymore. Uh, or a cash you know. Ah, uh, you got you to have some wire outside. Yeah. You gotta, <laughs> uh, more recently, this is a set I built that I have sitting in my living room. Uh, I'm in, there's this, there's this delineation between the city mouse and the country mouse. You know, the country mouse has a, a thousand foot long antenna, but he can hear Duluth. And the city mouse can't hear beyond the city limits, but he gets seven stations and can use a, use a uh, speaker on it. Uh, so this was sort of a, a city radio. Same circuit, uh, but I used a transformer here and a set of the cheap earbuds to leverage that situation. Inside it's like this. The lid here was a piece of PC material that I painted black on the outside. Nice hammerland capacitor. Coil mounted on the switch like, like I showed you in the other picture. Um, and with 20 feet of wire up behind a curtain and across the, the ceiling by a ceiling beam, this thing works just fine for what I, for what I use it for. Uh, you may have noticed in that circuit that there was a resistor and capacitor connected in series with the transformer primary. And this is what in crystal set circuits has become known as the Benny resistor. And that's named after our own Ben Tung who pointed out why you need this. The DC resistance of this transformer primary is much too low to make a good load for the diode for the rectified carrier power. And you end up with, you end up with distortion. So what you do is, it, if you're ended up with, I don't know, 60, 65K impedance here, you put about a resistor of approximately that value in series and you bypass it for audio, like with a 0.01 cap, and that cleans it up. So in all of these circuits where I have transformers, you'll see the Benny resistor. Here's, here's Ben Tung at the Crystal Set Clinic. I was just glad that he came to, to oversee that thing. And um, his website survives. He got interested in Crystal Set's middle 90s or so, about the time I was doing it. And he's one of the best engineers in the world. And uh, he just beat it to death and wrote it up. So if you really get into this, look at the Ben Tung site, which somebody has still kept preserved. And, hey, hey, yeah. I don't know about that one, but I bought one of his crystal sets at the, at the estate sale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he was, that was what Upper Montclair signals are pretty. Upper Montclair, West, West, Orange. West Orange. Oh, okay. Oh, but, but signals are strong there. So, but they, but he built good crystal built 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 good crystal sets. Uh, here's another one. It's out on the table out there. Same same circuit. More more turns on the core because I only had a, a smaller plastic transistor radio style capacitor here. This works pretty good and same deal, transformer and, and the Benny resistor. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on transformers. I think I'd done this in a previous presentation. You can, you can read it, but basically transformers don't really have impedances. They have turns ratios. And if you know the turns ratio, then you can calculate the impedance transformation. And you've, 
They, of course, have values assigned to the transformer, but you can cheat almost by a factor of 10 and still get stuff through the transformer. Um, if you can find the microphone input transformers, they work pretty good in crystal sets to get out to a low impedance headset. Uh, I, I had looked up these prices when they were new, and uh, sure enough, those are the same kind of prices you'll pay if you find one on eBay. So that maybe isn't the answer. Uh, you can do things with lined voice coil transformers, and you can still buy these things. They've got a whole bunch of turns and a whole bunch of different impedance ratios. Uh, you can klutz around until you get what you want. That's one of the, one of the solutions. Uh, a couple of other transformers that are available. Uh, a Japanese company named Tamura makes a guy called MET-01. Uh, Mauser will sell you these for 13 bucks. It's about the size of the end of your thumb, and it makes a transformation from 200K down to low impedance. Yes? An excellent branded transformer you can find on the surplus market is UTC. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> So have uh, uh, hi-fi 20 to 20k uh, frequency. Yeah, the, the, for instance, the linear standard UTCs and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, the audio fools have gotten wise to that, and you're, <laughs> well, I will be asking a lot of money for them. Uh, there's a guy on eBay who has had wound up some. They're not. They're really auto, auto transformers rather than transformers for crystal set uses. And they've got taps from 4 ohms out to 200K ohms. And you can kind of pick what ratio you want. Uh, your Benny resistor ends up in series with the input rather than in the ground circuit. But they're 20 bucks on eBay. So that might be a, might be a possibility. OK. We've talked about, well, like I called the one a pretty good crystal set. Now let's talk about really good crystal sets. And to, fig to figure this out, um, I'm, I'm, a compu I'm a communications receiver guy. And what you need to do is go back and see what they did for communication receivers more than 100 years ago. And the real answer is that they use double tuned circuits, which improve selectivity, improve sensitivity. And, uh, and now we use modern, more sensitive headsets. So we're going to kind of ape the the old Marconi things. By the way, these, these radios were designed to work way down into the long wave range, and, and they really don't work all that well in the broadcast band. But there's some design things here that, that are helpful. So two-circuit tuner. And here we are back to the Marconi 4.7s patent. You know, you tune the antenna with this coil, and you tune the secondary here. And one of the earliest good references I found to this was there's this set of books called Every Man's Guide to Radio that Radio Magazine published. And here in 19, the 1926 issue, they show this circuit. And you read the text, and these guys knew what was going on. And so <clears throat> they have a primary here, primary capacitor. You're varying the coupling between the coils by moving the coils. And they were smart enough to tap the detector halfway down the tank. So this, this is inductively coupled. And it's inductively coupled. We'll talk about this a little bit more here. Uh, when you use two tune circuits, here's the response of one. The resultant response is the algebraic sum of the two curves. So you make an improvement like this. Now, the other thing that happens with the coupling, if you couple those two coils tightly together, you end up with two peaks, one of the primary, one of the secondary. And when I was do doing the development work on these radios, I had the good fortune of having a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator so you could watch this stuff in real time as you messed with it. And so you couple the coils tightly, you try to bring this guy over to this guy, and this guy runs away from it. You can't do it. But you reduce the coupling 
to a point called critical coupling where you got the same output voltage, but both frequencies coincide and the selectivity gets better. Now, beyond that, you can couple still more loosely. You give up some amplitude, but you get better selectivity. So that's the, that's the deal in these radios is you have variable coupling and uh, you can select how much coupling you want to have. Pardon me? Is there any benefit on sensitivity? Well, there, there, there's a benefit in that you've got a conjugate match to the antenna. You've got the maximum current you can possibly pull out of the antenna, and then you couple that into the rest of the radio. So it's better than... It's, it's better. It's, in most cases, it's better than, than the other arrangements. You can, you can zero in on it pretty good. And the extra selectivity is really helpful. Uh, the easy way to do this, uh, I, I didn't have one to bring around, but I saw a picture of it, the pretty good crystal set. They're pretty easy to build, like so. Same, it's, you should know this circuit by now. And now you build another one of these things. You put the coil on the left side of it here, and you wire it up this way. You set it on the table, go like this, and you've got a double-tuned radio. Now, the way you operate these things is you turn this one all the way up to the high-frequency end. You pull them up tight against each other, and then you tune the primary until you hear a station, and then you back out here and retune the secondary, and then you get maximum maximum sensitivity and selectivity. Uh, in fact, those, those old 110-year-old communication receivers had circuits in them to make the secondary on-tuned, aperiodic, so you could do that very same thing. And what so, might you be looking at in terms of the... Oh, about, about critical coupling, maybe about this far apart. You, it, when I first did it, I was, I was amazed at actually how far apart they really were. Cause, you know, you wind coils and you put them like this. Well, no, you, it, it's kind of coil this big. It's kind of like that. Uh, <clears throat> I was hanging out with some people on the web that ran a, a crystal set DX contest back in the day. And this was a radio I built. Uh, these were six inch coils, uh, number 16 uh, uh, silver Teflon wire. Uh, the, the tuning caps and stuff are down here. You had them up on this towel rack, you know, to keep them away from things. And, and you just slide them back and forth. This third coil here was set up as a wave trap so you could tune out unwanted stations with it. Um, in fact, this box down here has a, uh, uh, a UTC linear standard transformer on it that goes from, I think it was 100K down to 600 ohms, and that worked real well. Um, so, yes? Well, but it's a, it's a, it's a big coil. <laughs> it, it, and, and the thicker the wire is, the less resistance you have. Now, there's a whole... School, a whole school of thought in the crystal set community about ultra high Q coils. And you get guys rounding up Litz wire as thick as your little finger and making coils and claiming Qs of 5,000 or something like that. I'm not really sure that does you any good because once you put a load on it, you've DQ'd it anyway. Someday I may have to get serious. But these, these coils had a Q of, I think, about four or 500. And so they, they worked pretty well. And how well did they work? Well, I used this thing in one of our, our early DX contests. And uh, four Chicago stations, uh, RVC down in Turks and Caicos was on the air at the time. But of course, they were, they were half a million watts, heard them. But also heard Radio Raylo out of Cuba. And uh, with that wave trap, was able to sneak up close to WCBS and hear New Orleans on 1170 or 1070, whatever it is, and uh, 870 rather. So that's the kind of performance that's possible with a not too 
out of control radio. Uh, here's, here's a portable I built uh, sitting out at the table out here. What actually happened here was I had built one of these not quite as fancy, the components weren't quite as good, and I was attending the AWA conference in those days and I went up and set the thing up in the, um, in the flea market area. Now this is like four miles from WHAM, so I put up a, a modest antenna and I was able to play the radio through a horn speaker and people walking by 10 feet from it could, could listen to it just fine. That led to me doing a presentation for them up there the next year and one of these guys says to me, can you, can you make me a radio like that? And I said, yeah, but it's going to cost you some money. He says, you know, we settled, I think we settled on 600 bucks or something like that. And I built a pair of these, one for him and one for me. But this uses the, the, uh, the, ferrite, the ferrite coils. Uh, because all the, the magnetic field is contained within the cores, you can't really couple them. So you end up using a mutual inductance down here to control the, uh, control the coupling. Uh, I had a nice transformer. Uh, in keeping with what they did with those early sets like the Marconi's, there's a buzzer here that will get you some RF to adjust your cat's whisker if you can't hear any signals on the air. Dave? I don't know what that means, using a mutual inductance. Oh, oh. You've got, a, you've got this open circuit here capacitance out here in the antenna. You've got a tank around this way. But in the ground return, we have another coil. And that coil is shared with the secondary thing. And so if that coil is essentially shorted all the way out, then you don't have any extra couple. You don't have any real coupling. And as you increase that inductance, the coupling between the two coils increases. And in fact, that K value in that drawing is K is for mutual inductance, however you get it, whether it's by actually having the inductors share a magnetic field or by doing something like that. Uh, there's the inside of it. It was a pretty nice job. I, had, I dug up hammer, good quality hammer and capacitors and whatnot. Uh, pardon me? No, no, that's that's just a, just, just that, that's a cap, that that's a cap. It just happens to look like that. It's it's just two caps. Uh, here's another radio I built, another double tune set, in a, in a tackle box from Kmart, uh, and, you know, same same kind of thing. You got your secondary over here. I manage the coupling by a bunch of taps rather than another coil or anything like that. And I provided a switch up here so you could operate this thing as a single tuned crystal set. Again, there's a capacitor and a Benny resistor. One of the tricks with the Benny resistor is if you're in a fairly strong signal area, you can put a voltmeter out here and read the rectified DC coming off the detector and now you have an S meter. So you can make comparisons for tuning or changing your antennas or things like that. That's sort of city mouse stuff. It won't, won't happen out in the country very well. And uh, have a switch over, they, both this and that previous set, there's a switch out here that you can decide whether that input circuit is either series tuned or parallel tuned because if you get hooked up to a real short antenna, then you want it to be parallel tuned and you just top couple into the coil. So that's a pretty nice radio. There's the inside of it. Uh, took the tackle box and cut some of the partitions out of it. Uh, mounted it up that way. Uh, there's a travel kit I assembled to go with it. There's a single earpiece uh, sound powered phone there and some other stuff. You know, if you get in a hotel room or something so you can stick up an antenna. Uh, one more, I talked about this at a meeting a year or two ago. Uh, the Jersey City Special. And this started with this radio that used to be in the Signal Corps Museum at Fort Monmouth. And the neat thing about it was that this radio had been evaluated by the Division of Research and Inspection in Paris during World War I, which was Armstrong's 
unit, and they drew up blueprints of the radio, and, and they're on, uh, on one, of the, one of the websites. So I said, oh, it was a pretty neat radio. Let's, let's, let's kind of ape this circuit. So, you know, the thing, thing where I live, this thing will drive a speaker real, real well. And so what you have is you have a secondary coil here. Uh, the, the German set tuned two bands. And in keeping with one of Ben Tung's tricks, I divided this coil in half. And for the upper band, for the lower band, it uses the two halves of the coils in, in series. For the upper half, it puts them in parallel. Uh, the interesting thing about a double tuned set is when it is lightly coupled or just down around critical coupling, you can calibrate the secondary. And so I did that with the dial here. In fact, uh, the, 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 the Germans had actually done that in this set too. The Germans were also smart enough to tap their detector halfway down the coil. Everybody else in the world was just didn't, hadn't figured that out. Uh, and so this had the primary here, uh, there's a switch that selects taps, and then this rotates to do the coupling. Came out pretty nice. I actually built an S meter into it, and I put the detector in an old crystal container because that's the way the Telefunken de detector was set up. Uh, kind of like that. Uh, here's a pretty outrageous crystal set. In fact, I met Mike Tuggle at the AWA convention when I was starting this stuff. And he was building these radios with basket weave coils. That means you don't have any extra stuff in there except wire and Litz wire. Uh, this particular version, his, his antenna and ground come in over here. He's got his, his primary tuned circuit, which happens to be on a ferrite rod, and then couples it to a secondary circuit. And then he has two more coils as wave traps, so he can do all kinds of tuning tricks. Uh, Mike got involved in some of the early Crystal Set DX contests. He was doing OK. And then he moved to Hawaii. And from Hawaii, with this, he could hear the Caribbean and half the United States. And it killed the contests. <laughs> but uh, Mike's, Mike's stuff is, is documented on the web and that's you know about as about as cra as crazy as you ought to get there's crazier things yet but but mike did a real good job and uh, uh they they work really well again it's a sound powered headset back here so here's something i threw together just recently here's a beginner's crystal set for the antique radio guy you don't have parts your junk box sucks next time an all-American five is going wanting. Tear it apart. Here's the antenna rod. This one was on a PC board. I just took it on the table saw and chopped that part out. The we have a we we have a germanium diode. The output transformer from the all-American five when hooked to one of these sets of earbuds with the earbuds in series about 30 ohms and this gets you about 10k ohms out here so that's a pretty good match and uh, the input tuning is done with two the two halves of the variable capacitor uh, if th this guy oh, I'm sorry let's this guy was pretty tightly wound and I didn't want to try to dig into it to make a center tap for the uh, detector. So I estimated the number of turns, 80 turns or so, scramble wound 40 turns of wire around here and use that for the detector. Uh, this thing works reasonably well. It's kind of like the, the pretty good crystal set and it's you know just, just made out of all American five junk and, and a, cheap, a cheap headset which might have even come from the dollar store. So, that's pretty much my story. Build a crystal set. It's good for your karma. Qu questions? <laughs> so I have one. Yeah.
to the Heath kit crystal set, which works pretty well. You know, you know it. Uh, well, in fact, we have one in the museum. Okay, so and I hooked it up a week or two ago, and I wasn't. I, it's it's double, it's double tuned, but but it's but it's not. But but there's no variable coupling, and I wasn't impressed. Okay. It wor you know it works it better. Is, it works is, better at all. It, it is double tuned. tuned. They have they have two um, two coils with with ferrite slugs in them. I think maybe they're on the same form and two coils and it it it's double tuned. But I don't th I I was I, I was expecting more from it. Yes. Yeah, instead of a crystal or solid state diode, has anyone? tried to make a set with a vacuum tube diode? Oh, sure, you can do that. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not... Is it worse or better or You know, I, I, I think I tried that at one time, and yes, sir? For contest, I even put a 1B3 in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was able to pick up the local station that's just across the river from me. Oh, okay. It works really good. Yeah, I think if, if I was going to do that, it'd be a 6AL5 six six and, six and, yeah, and see I'm what happens. That's hysterical, though, on B3. That's right. <laughs> it worked, though. Devil. Uh, four or well, five years ago, I built a copy of Al's double tuned crystal set and uh, did very well in the DX contest. It's a very good circuit. Yeah, I'm I'm kind I'm kind of proud of this stuff because it was done by somebody who had taken a t taken time being a design engineer for a while and using test equipment and things like that. The guys back in the 1920s, you got to cut them a break. They didn't have any test equipment. They didn't really know what was what, and uh, so they were just sort of throwing things together. So there are a lot of uh, crystal sets, commercial sets that you can purchase. Yeah, like the forest has. You know, uh, there's the Radiola one. I think it was the. the so, do you have recommendations? What's what are the you, really? You talk ones? about old ones. Old ones. Yeah. Old ones. Um, I I like the Areola Junior. That was a that was a, a variometer set. Uh, in fact, I have a clone of one out here, and that works pretty well. It's a uh, it's a paracon detector, so it might work better if you clipped a clip the germanium diode in there, but uh, th that works pretty well. I saw one, um, Chris Pistelli brought around uh, a so-called stenite crystal set, which you know actually had a, well, it's sort of a variable capacitor in one of these book kind of things, but it had taps on the coil and things, and worked, worked better than most of the crappy ones. What about the deforest? This one that has the coils, I guess, for uh, loose copper. Well, there were, I, I don't know the details of that. There was, there was this deforest coil assembly, and yeah, you could use that to build a crystal set, and that would, that would work. I don't know if there was actually a deforest crystal set or not. Uh, there's also the BC-14, which was the World War I double tune set copied from some French thing. The Forest Company built some of those along with some other people, and they, they work reasonably well. Sir? Um, one of your circuits, so you said you didn't have a 365 capacitor, yeah. so you mod well, modified the coil. Yeah. So my question is, so the standard always seems to be 365. Yeah. So now, if public broadcast fan, if you have a given, you know the 365, what would the the stand the, the stand will be a certain dumpings? Yeah, two two fifty micro henrys three sixty five. Right. So now if you go with a two fifty picofarad capacitor. Then you then you need more inductance. Right. And see what so would have happened. But, 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 but yeah, there's formulas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But fifty turns and then cut and paste until you got it working. I mean and in the old days what the problem was, like you do those close wound magnet wire coils. You got so much capacitance build up that if you make them bigger than 250 microhenries, you can't get them up to the top end of the broadcast band. So that 250 microhenry 365 was kind of a sweet spot. But now when you come to when you come to magnetic core coils, you don't have the extra capacitance, and you can make much higher inductance coils and get away with a smaller cap. Yes. And in the IRF business, I have, I have wound coils where the cell with a mutual uh, capacitance, uh, distributed capacitance, 
uh, mixed with the adults, it's actually caused them to be self-resonant, and they, they work as extremely good filter chokes for a single frequency. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're absolutely, they, they just completely eat that frequency. Yeah, every, every coil has a, a natural, a natural self resonance. And you don't want, if you're using it for, for receiving, you don't want it to be in the band you're trying to get. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> By the way, also on lossy plastics, I've had uh, inductors burst into flame. <laughs> You're working in transmitters, obviously. Yeah, yeah, industrial RF generators. <laughs> oh, geez, okay. <laughs> I've had keys. I, I was in my earlier days, I wound a, uh, a, a uh, transformer, an RF transformer, uh -huh. with uh, regular SJ, uh, not, um, what do they call that? The, the, the PVC uh, uh, household wire they use. Uh, oh, yeah. T A T H whatever it is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, T H H N or something like that. I wound up with that stuff, yeah. and to say it made a smoke signal would be. <laughs> it was an explosion. <laughs> I think it was five kilowatts. Yeah. Well, back in the day when I was uh, doing crystal sets. But I think, sorry. I mean that will eat up if you if you if you're working with low level signals, it's still lossy. You're going to eat up your signal. Yeah. Yeah. 50s, 60s, I was building these. Yeah. Uh, they were selling these little loop sticks. Yep. Okay, so you can 365, and you can get the, the Miller loop stick. Right. Jet Lock the other one. Mm -hmm. And they made the high Q one, the high gain ones. Um, so they good for each other. The, well, they don't work, but you really ought to figure out some way to couple. For the tap. For, for, yeah, for the tap. tap for the detector yeah, or, yeah. or wind, put another winding on it. to. Yeah, well, it's what it's what we what what appeared in all those construction articles because you could go out and buy one for a dollar and and do it. Anything else? Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>